welcome to this discussion as part of our Middle East series on Islamic finance. Uh, the session today is pr proudly brought to you in partnership with Standard Chartered uh, Private Bank. We're looking forward to a great discussion over the hour ahead. Uh, as always with these sessions, we're joined by two audiences, an audience of PCD members with us on Zoom, uh, and also a broader audience on YouTube. Both audiences are able to submit questions across the course uh, of the discussion, um, but after about 50 minutes, we're going to cut the live stream link and uh, do some networking, take a live Q&A with our PCD members on Zoom. So uh, I hope you're looking forward to a terrific uh, hours discussion ahead. We've had great interest and demand uh, for this topic. So looking forward to getting into the discussion. And to get us underway, I'd like to welcome Christopher Fisher to the session uh, today and just explain why this topic is important for Standard Chartered. Chris, over to you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for making the time to join us today. Uh, Standard Chartered Private Bank is delighted to partner with the PCD Club today for this Middle East series event on Islamic finance, capitalizing the untapped potential. Now, why is Islamic finance important to Standard Chartered? Having been on the ground for over a century in the Middle East and over 160 years in Asia, Standard Chartered has strong and long lasting relationships with Middle East, Middle East and, and Asian investors, and now allowing us to bring them the best insights into their investment preferences and Sharia structuring requirements. Standard Chartered is the only international bank to, with a global Islamic banking franchise, Standard Chartered Sadiq, providing Islamic banking products across our footprints, Asia, Africa, and Middle East. The private bank Middle East team, many of which are on the call today, work alongside Islamic banking experts, such as Huram on the panel, to understand their financing and investment needs and bring our clients the best financial solutions in accordance with their Sharia preferences. So enjoy the session. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Christopher. I'd um, like to welcome and open up the discussion with Horam Halal, um, who is with Standard Chartered in the UAE and a subject matter expert on this important field. So welcome, Horam. Thank you, David. appreciate it. Um, so first of all, um, what is Islamic finance and what differentiates it from conventional banking? Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to the session. Uh, so, <clears throat> diving straight into the discussion, Islamic finance refers to a model of banking and finance which is governed by the rules of Islamic law, which is commonly known as uh, Sharia. Now, at the heart of these rules is the prohibition of interest, uh, which is interestingly something which has been consistently deemed forbidden under all religious scriptures going back thousands of years. And for that reason, Islamic banking is also often known as interest-free banking. But I think it's much more than, than that. So if you look at the, the, the broader principles, it asks for transparency, fairness, and just business practices, and being socially responsible. So in short, it's a form of banking that has to comply with a, a system of religious values and ethos. Now, what makes it different from conventional banking? What are the key areas of differences? So there are quite a few uh, uh, differences, but if you kind of boil them, you know, sort of bring them down to two major themes, number one would be the prohibition of interest, as I talked about. So which basically means that Islamic banks cannot lend money on interest, right? So on the financing side, they cannot lend money on interest. So then the question that arises, it, you know, as we all know, banking on both sides of the balance sheet, it's, it's either a depositor lending money to the bank or the bank lending money to a borrower. So if you take away lending and interest out of a bank, you know, how do you really run a bank? It's a very common question that comes across. So, what Islamic banks do instead is that they engage in actual economic activity, such as trading. You go and buy and sell certain assets and, and the resulting uh, a, a, you know, uh, differences is the profit. They do renting or leasing of assets. This is for tangible fixed assets. And then they participate in um, equity sharing contracts, profit and loss sharing. They invest for a profit and loss sharing basis. And lastly, providing services against a fee. So as an example, if you go to a conventional bank, a traditional interest-based bank and ask for a home mortgage, 
the bank would essentially lend you money and take the title of the property as collateral. Um, so let's you know simply put how a mortgage works. My my legal colleagues on the call you know will will uh, will, will tell you that it takes much more than that. But simply put, that's what a mortgage uh, is. But if you were to go to an Islamic bank for the same transaction. So what an Islamic bank in turn would do is that instead of lending money to the customer, it would actually buy the asset. It will buy the property and rent it out to the customer for a defined period, say five years, 10 years, whatever is the tenor of the facility. And then it gives the customer the option to own the property at a future date at a free, you know, pre, pre, predetermined, prefixed price. So essentially it's a rent to own uh, a scheme that's you know point number one that's a, the first big difference between uh, you know, structurally between conventional bank and islamic bank the second difference is the application of ethical principles of uh, business dealing so as i mentioned earlier transparency fair dealings um so i i remember when i joined the bank this was a long time back. Um, so our legal team would draft contracts and you know bring them to us for approval. This is for Islamic products, right? So often they would just pick up the gist of the contract from a previous conventional banking uh, uh, you know product, and um, and I will find this very standard clause in the contract that would say, you know, typically would would go like this: the bank reserves the right to amend, cancel, or terminate the facility without assigning any reason whatsoever. So now, so this is a very overpowering clause, you know, tilted in the favor of the bank. So uh, you would not find this clause in Islamic finance contract. So I would, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I used to, you know, I'd, I'd love to go and press the delete button on, on this clause every time around, right? So this is, this is, you know, a fundamental difference when it comes to the application of eth ethical principles, um, uh, you know, in, in, in Islamic uh, finance. So uh, an Islamic finance institution is really designed based on these principles. Mm -hmm. Now, to implement these principles, you have to make certain infrastructural changes which differentiate an Islamic bank from a conventional bank. To just give you one example, um, Islamic banks have this concept of a Sharia board. So a Sharia board is an independent um, uh, body um, which comprises of people from the community. Uh, they're, they're experts in Islamic Sharia, but it's really a community board where an independent group of people are having oversight over the governance of, of uh, the business, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a governance and oversight committee over and above what the bank already has, so over and above what a typical conventional bank would have. But um, it's not just, um, uh, you know, in, an oversight committee. In fact, it is very powerful. In most of the markets, the regulators have given tremendous amount of power to this board. So essentially, every product that the bank offers uh, at the design stage has to be approved by this committee. So that involves the structure of the product, the legal documentation, the types of fees and charges. So again, you know, this independent body is assessing the product um, for its fairness, for, you know, its, its, its equitable treatment of the customer. And not, not only that, what they also do is once the product gets rolled out, the same body of scholars, the Sharia board, they would also have through, through on-ground resources that they have embedded in the, in, in the bank, they will also carry out what we call an assurance process, so review and audit and assurance, whatever, by whatever name you want to call it. And looking at the results from the assurance review, they have the powers to actually tell the bank, you know what, you went off the line in this transaction, you need to give the profits back to the customer. Refund the profits from the facility to the customer because you overcharge the customer or something. Similarly, they could even tell you if, for example, the transaction of, of a nature that where reversal to the customer is not possible, they may they tell the bank, okay, fine, uh, you can't give it back to the customer, but we won't allow you to keep the, the, this excess money as well. You pay it out in charity, right? So, so this is, again, a unique concept um, uh, that we see in Islamic finance. And to me, I think these are very, very powerful concepts and uh, they provide an added layer of 
of comfort uh, really to the stakeholders, which are your customers, your shareholders, your regulators, that, that their interests are being uh, protected. Over to you, David. Thank you for setting that out so clearly. I mean, how do you see Islamic products being used by non-Muslim clients? I mean, the, and there's a, obviously ESG and sustainable and ethical investing is, is really in vogue at the moment. So is there an opportunity there for, for people wanting to integrate, as you said, the ethical principles and the transparency and fairness that you just set out? What, what's your view on that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, the, you know, in a lot of countries, and this is, this is now Islamic banking has been around for more than in, in its modern form, it's been around for more than 30, 35 years now, um, I would say, we see um, that uh, a lot of non-Muslim customers are engaging. Yeah, a lot of uh, non-Muslim customers are uh, engaging with Islamic financial um, uh, institutions. And, uh, you know, these, these values and principles, uh, you know, they resonate with everyone. So uh, regardless of, of, of faith, everyone you know, appreciates fair dealing. Everyone appreciates transparency, trust. These are universal human values. So as an example, we see in, uh, in Malaysia, which is one of the largest and oldest franchise um, uh, for, for Standard Chartered. We started Islamic banking in Malaysia back in 1993. And what we see there is more than 70% of our clientele is Chinese clients. These are Buddhist Chinese clients. And it's not just for Standard Charter, it's the broader Malaysian Islamic finance industry. That's the same, uh, you know, sort of case. So now, you know, that's the lay of the land there that you have a large Chinese population. But what we see is that over the years, these customers have come to appreciate the value of Islamic finance institutions. And, and they're either agnostic. So they say, I'm OK to deal with an Islamic bank. I'm OK to deal. Uh, or they, are, they actually, in many cases, prefer Islamic banks for the reason that I just uh, set out. Now, obviously, ESG and SRI, you know, social responsible investment, they're very closely linked to Islamic finance. In fact, I would say the principles of being socially responsible, um, environmentally conscious, uh, they've been embedded in fundamental principles of Islamic law, you know, dating back, you know, 1400 years. So there are clear injunctions um, in the law around not harming the environment, not harming the animals or any, any living being for no reason, not being wasteful um, in, 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 uh, in consuming the resources, the planet, planetary resources that we have. In fact, this in, it, this in itself is a, is a topic, but um, as a result of these principles, uh, as an example, I'm just saying that Islamic banks, for example, um, they would not finance a company which has a core business which is harmful to the larger society. So, you know, there's a restriction on dealing with tobacco firms, there's a restriction on dealing with alcohol firms, gambling, arms and ammunition, etc. So, you know, it's the, it's this, this ethos is, is, is built at the heart of, of what we do in, in Islamic banking. Over to you, David. Thank you. And we wanted to frame this discussion around opportunities, around expansion and innovation. And I mean, what do you see in terms of new entrants and opportunities? Are there new funds being set up on these principles, new banks even being formed to, to, to foster to this need? What, what's your take on the, the innovation and, and new impact in this space? Yeah, so obviously Islamic banking is now a, 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 a big phenomenon and, and uh, it's a, you know, by estimates, it's a, it's a $2.9 trillion industry, right? If you add up Islamic banks, Islamic asset management firms, Islamic insurance, which is um, you know, called the Kaful, and other associated um, institutions. So it's a big, big industry, and, and actually it has attracted interest um, from, from all corners. So you see two types of institutions, broadly speaking. You've got um, institutions which do only Islamic banking, you call full-fledged institutions, like I'm based here in the UAE, so Dubai Islamic Bank, or in Saudi Arabia, you have the Al Raji Bank. These are the big giants of this industry globally. And then you have window operators, so banks like Standard Chartered, which are principally conventional banking institutions, but they, based on the demand from their customers, are offering um, Sharia compliant products um, across their network. We see a lot of interest from the governments 
a uh, lot of interest is, is, is being taken uh, from the governments across the world including in the muslim world as well as in the in, in, in the non muslim majority um countries so you know supporting and promoting through legislation <laughs> regulations and in many cases tax incentives um as well most inter- international financial centers are active uh, in this space so you take uk you take hong kong you take take singapore most have come out with their own sovereign uh, debt issuances program so uk government just very recently did a um a, a, a refresh uh, of their um, original sukuk issuance that in the new sukuk issuance this year uh, again and the, the government on, 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 on uh, several fronts has come out and made statements around islamic finance they want uk and london to be the hub of islamic finance activity in europe so broadly speaking you know these are you know sort of the um, uh, sort of the different types of participants that we see uh, active in this space in terms of trends i would say you know esg and sri is is gaining you know huge popularity uh, we talked about it earlier so i'm not going to go into the detail um digitization so obviously the whole world is you know is 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 now uh, kind of actively moving in this space but i think for islamic finance digitization has a very you know peculiar kind of a, a impact so because islamic finance is much younger as compared to conventional banking which has been around 400 450 years um so islamic finance has a particular uh, challenge of reach so in any given country uh, you would typically find conventional banking institutions having thousands of branches all over the country where islamic banks being new entrants they would it would take for them time to 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 expand the branch network and all that the other thing thing is that i was looking at some of the statistics around this If you look at the population of the of the the, the world's Muslim large majority Muslim countries, this OIC group as we call it, Organization of Islamic Countries, more than 50% of the population is aged less than 24 years, a very young population. And if you look at the mobile broadband penetration, that's at 64%, growing at a rate of 35%. And 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 these are you know. Uh, huge kind of game changes when it comes so for islamic finance digitization is a huge opportunity that allows these institutions to really leap from where could they could not you know because of physical ability uh, you know limitations they could not reach out to 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 audience all over the country or all over the world now through digital platforms you can really reach out to you know customer sitting in any part of the world so you've now started seeing announcements and there was uh, announcements earlier this year about full fledged digital islamic banks so you know the challenger banks so to say full fledged islamic challenger banks coming on and um, there are more announcements being made so the huge amount of investment that's um, going in this space over to you david um, there's a question from uh, husam reno just asking Is, is Islamic finance more secure than conventional banking? I presume by that he means is the business model does it make those institutions more robust long term? You know, in terms of the security, I suppose of the the institution. Do you think there's 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 an angle there, or or that you know any bank can be uh, vulnerable in financial crises? What, what's your view on that? So it's it's a very interesting question, and and what we noticed in the 2008 financial crisis that people you know started drawing uh, uh, these uh, uh, you know sort of these uh, comparisons. So uh, the impact that we saw in 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 the global you know sort of financial uh, you know world, I would say across the world, uh, Islamic finance institutions were to some extent not fully. Of course, you're part of this. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a global. village as we call it right everything is interconnected so when the economy is coming down everyone gets affected but islamic financial institutions were were insulated so i am not aware of any islamic financial institution or a bank that went bust mm. in that cycle mm. there was none across the world that went bust right um and i think at the heart of it is as i talked about you know uh, by concept islamic banks cannot engage into speculative activity they cannot go and trade into you know instruments you know what really triggered the the whole 2008 you know the lehman brother uh, 
collapse and all that. We all know the story. But those instruments per se are not permissible in Islamic finance. So Islamic finance is, as I said, often you know people also um, uh, refer to it as asset backed or asset based finance. This always has to be a tangible thing that you're financing. You can't just go and finance thin air. You can't get into speculative stuff, right? So that keeps the structure, the the, the 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 overall structure secure, right? And and by the very nature of some of the structures that we use in Islamic finance, like ijara for infrastructure financing, um, Islamic bonds, which are called sukuk, are mostly based on this concept. There's always an underlying asset. There's always an underlying asset. So that. Yes, does add to the protection, but that, but, but I would would qualify that statement with, uh, you know, by saying that yes, of course, um, any systemic shocks, um, you know, uh, are are obviously you know felt by everyone, and Islamic banks do get affected, but they are uh, they, they they fare relatively better. Okay, thank you, and thank you for your question, Hazim. If there's further questions, please do put them in the chat, and I'll bring them back on. Uh, uh, to the panel. Um, I'd just like to thank you for that, Laurent, and I'd like to invite now Musafa Hussain from Akira in London uh, to come and develop the argument. Um, morning, uh, Mustafa. how are you? Hi, David. Good morning. It's nice to be back at the, the club, and uh, thank you to Christopher and Stephanie and Steve at the bank for, for having me. I appreciate it. Terrific. So we heard from Laurent there about innovation in the banking sector, how the sector is developing. Yeah. How being the fiduciary sector incorporating Sharia and, and in your work doing succession planning with families in the region? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think, um, uh, Kurum, uh, I would I would really emphasise all your, your points again. I think you, you said it all, really. Um, I think uh, on the in the fiduciary sector, um, uh, the need for innovation is really apparent and, and that uh, innovation to, to understand where we are now you kind of need to go back to the beginning uh, the, the best way of understanding sharia is to understand fundamentally what the islamic religion is all about um, islam is all about submission submission of a muslim to divine will and that submission is in all aspects of a Muslim's life, their family affairs, their civil affairs, their business affairs, um, their financial affairs. There is no distinction between those different areas of life. It's all one. So these are a set of principled ethical uh, uh, codes for the way in which you live your life according to a set of universal principles. And what's happened in the private client industry over the last uh, 20 or 30 years is that hundreds of uh, expert private client practitioners have said that they've got experience in advising uh, Muslim clients on Sharia succession planning. But of course, what that, what that means to them and what they have done is taken their conventional precedent documentation for common law trusts uh, and that sort of thing. And they've cut out the interest clauses and they've either entirely avoided forced airship rules or just a blanket bomb applied them uh, in, in a sort of waterfall of distributions. Uh, and the problem with that is that of those experts who've um, been applying those rules in, in the private client industry, if you were to ask them, can you explain to me the spirit or the intention? What is the morality behind why those principles exist in the first place? They can't do it. What they've done is reduced it to a list of do's and don'ts and just applied those with a rubber stamp. And that was never what Sharia was intended to do uh, when it came about uh, one and a half thousand years ago. It was um, a time of social reform, religious reform, civil reform. It, it came about in pagan Arabia in a, a tidal wave that washed away the existing societal setup through ethical conduct. Um, and that's really what it was supposed to, to be. And so um, it, it was always supposed to be that rights and obligations were supposed to ha go hand in hand. You were never supposed to cut them in half and apply one and not the other. And so um, e even if uh, I, I fully uh, I, I understand that even private clients come, the Muslim clients themselves come and say to their lawyers or whatever that I don't want to apply Sharia here and I do want it there. 
Um, but even they themselves don't necessarily always understand what solutions there are available in the private client world through things like beneficiary consent agreements uh, and uh, through lifetime gift uh, planning and through use of corporate vehicles and, and things like that. These are all areas where you can actually stay within the spirit and intention of what the rules were supposed to be doing in the first place and find compliant solutions that are not based around avoiding the law, but instead uh, working within it. And of course, this is really important because the fundamental risk here with private client structures like trusts is if you ignore um, forced airship rules or, or the principles that are behind it, then in the local courts in a, in a Muslim country, they could just ignore the private client structure and intervene and redistribute. Um, and, and so fundamentally, all of your planning as a private client practitioner could be for nothing if that, if that were to happen. And yes, there are challenges with Sharia. It's not codified. Um, it's subject to opinions. Opinions vary. Um, but that was always because Sharia was supposed to reflect um, individual justice for these particular parties in this particular circumstance. Uh, just like uh, uh, before judica, judicature in common law, equity was the same thing, exactly the same thing. And so I think innovation in the fiduciary sector is really looking like things like having Muslim protectors or trustees with Islamic expertise and experience, Sharia savvy investment advisors, the asset classes being screened, the debt in the in the trustee facilities being Sharia compliant, as well as having your waterfall and distribution. So that oversight with people that understand the spirit, the intention um, and the morality with a sort of Islamic conscience built into the structure is really where the industry needs to go further. OK, thanks. And we're going to develop some of those points with Marion uh, Kafena shortly. But I mean, have you seen, we're in these unprecedented times uh, with COVID. And when you've been advising clients on succession planning, have you seen any changes in behaviour and an uptick in philanthropy or a family still grappling with how the impact on their business, property and investments? What's your, what's your view on how it's changed mindsets? In this it's, it, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, David. Um, I think certainly in, in the Middle East, uh, they've certainly had oil price fluctuations for a while now, and the government cuts have also come into place. But when I first started working with Middle Eastern clients 25 years ago, you know, there was no such thing as local taxation. They didn't know or, or they felt that taxation was something that just did not apply to them. And now VAT has gone from 5% to 15% in quite a short space of time. So there's an evolution in the social contract between the citizen and the state in the Middle Eastern countries where taxation is becoming a key part of that. And unlike in the Western economies where taxation is linked to representation, um, that that isn't necessarily the case in the Middle East. Um, but, but what the Middle East is making real efforts towards is diversifying economies away from oil. Um, and of course, the, the, one of the biggest directions that they tried to pursue that diversification is with tourism, travel, financial services, small uh, enterprises, um, and uh, religious travel, particularly in places like Saudi Arabia, have always been big income generators. The Hajj pilgrimage is a massive revenue generator for the kingdom. Uh, and the fact that you've got a couple of million people or several million people less per year over the over the year, not just through the Hajj, but also with um, pilgrimage throughout the year. Um, you've got less travellers, less hotel stays, less consumption of local services, less investment, less spending around that. So there is going to be an impact from that uh, in the short term. Um, uh, for private clients themselves, they tend to have this lifestyle where, you know, um, Middle Eastern or Asian uh, Muslim clients will quite often come to, to London just before Ramadan, have a little holiday and then spend the summer in the south of France or in Geneva in Marbella, um, they might then go to the US for a holiday and then come back to London for Christmas. And with travel bans and COVID restrictions, mm -hmm. and you know, the, all of that has been impacted, but private clients tend to invest and spend and consume professional services in the places where they spend their leisure time, uh, as well as their business time. And so th there's obviously going to be a, an impact on that as well. But also strangely, for given that, you know, certainly in the Middle East, um, they're originally fundamentally a nomadic people that lived in a desert uh, uh, type environment, um, you know, and, and, and moved between different places. Real estate, despite their nomadic origins, real estate is a favorite 
ballast of uh, asset uh, class for, for Middle Easterners. Um, and what we're seeing with COVID is that the real estate market is going through a massive shift. We, ha- I, we don't quite know where that has ended up yet, but we, we know that for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, people are moving away from the big cities and going back to the countryside and offices are being changed into residential and shared workspace and and leasing is all affected in in a very new, very revolutionary way. And rental income for private clients will be affected by that um, as as the property world shifts on its axis. But your question about philanthropy, I mean, one of the one of the fundamental tenets of the Islamic religion is uh, zakat, or the payment of charitable alms to the poor and the needy, and that's enshrined, as, uh, you know, in in law and and, and non negotiable. Um, and so uh, that that constant level of giving remains um, enshrined and, and a fixed obligation. And so that's a beautiful thing about it being fixed that no matter what's happening to your income, your, your obligations to give a percentage remain the same. And so hopefully that will remain consistent. Okay, thank you. And um, as we discussed with Huram, we wanted to frame this session around opportunities. I mean, do you see opportunities for Islamic finance products and service providers in this context of ESG, more ethical concerns, a a broader market of of investors and consumers? What's What's your take on that and the opportunity? I, I think it's there, David. I really do. I, I see it quite clearly. I mean, it doesn't really get more mainstream in, in England than um, the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times is kind of one of those bastions of Englishness. What you think about when you think of Middle India, Middle England, you, you think of the Sunday Times. And, and in March 2021, uh, the Sunday Times financial section had a, a review of Islamic financial Sharia compliant uh, retail products, which it was uh, endorsing as entirely not only suitable but uh, recommended for regular uh, um, uh, Christian, uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, uh, Hindu, whatever race, whatever background, whoever you are, wherever you're from, the the way that they looked at these products, Sharia compliant products, was that they stand up now on performance basis against conventional products, but also um, they are sensible because they've been screened Socially responsible investing, which Koram mentioned, is a really big theme at the moment. SRI is all about screening. It's about applying filters to what what it is that you're investing in. And ESG is fundamentally just about uh, good risk analysis, understanding what what is um, the risk profile attached to investments. And what the Sunday Times was saying was that these um, Sharia compliant investments are mitigated against capital adequacy, they are risk managed, they are non-exploitative, they're socially responsible, they're slightly more conservative than conventional products, but that's given them resilience in times of crisis, which COVID has been. So um, it, it's a reflection of the market shift, really, because the 1980s was all sort of greed is good and your Gordon Gecko type mentality. And then uh, by the time we, we got to the early 2000s and the Lehman Brothers era. It was about maximizing your risk in order to make the biggest possible returns that you could get, even if you didn't understand what it was that you were investing in. Um, and, and I think that the Sharia compass uh, has been there for, for one and a half thousand years. Um, and this movement of building the economy back better post COVID with its focus on ESG and SRI um, will look at something like uh, a Sharia compliant finance and see that as just a millennium old SRI screen, which has been there based on social reform principles in the same way that we will now undergo a period of social reform post COVID pandemic to build back better. And people like millennials or baby boomers, you now see them uh, aligning their personal values with their business values and uh, and their purchasing decisions for products and services. So they might uh, drive an electric car, use recycled bags, recycle their glass, avoid taking aeroplane flights um, and purchase products from a bank that has an ethical offering because they see that as an all encompassing moral compass to the way that they live their life. And that is exactly the same as what Sharia has been doing, uh, like I said, in, as a reflection of the Islamic way of life in, in encompassing all areas of your life, 
not just your business investment affairs, but everything uh, in, in the way that you live your life. You're now seeing that with the millennial attitude to consumption of professional services. And particularly since they want to avoid the pitfalls of greenwashing, and that sort of thing, um, you wouldn't go to a millennial like that and say as a private client, look, um, I know you, you drive an electric car, but when we set up your trust, um, you know, the trust is investing in assets that are child labor intense disposable fascial investments or a super high risk payday lending uh, profile. You just wouldn't do that. And that's why this point about understanding the spirit and intention of these moral principles and applying them holistically through the entire structure is much more reflective of where the market is at at the moment. Terrific. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mustafa. And, and on that note, I'd like to bring in Marianne Kafeina from Harbot and Lewis in London. Uh, welcome, Marianne. Hi, David. So we heard uh, from Mustafa there the idea of incorporating Sharia into, into succession planning. How do you see that uh, discussion and uh, in, in your work with clients? Oh, you're on mute there, Marianne, sorry. Thank you, David. So first, I think uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to start by doing is trying to unite the starting point for everybody on the call by taking a little step back. Because, so I grew up in the Middle East. My early schooling was done in Arabic. I attended a school where religious studies was mainly for my Muslim colleagues and, and uh, teachers. I learned a lot by osmosis as children do. In thinking about clients and their succession with Islamic Sharia succession in mind, we have to start from a place of understanding and knowing that we're talking about nearly a quarter of the world's population. A quarter of the world's population is Muslim. And of those, the majority are the Sunni branch. We also need to remind ourselves that classical Arabic is the liturgical language of Islam. And therefore, when you discuss Islam and you refer to it, a lot of the reflexes around thinking tend to uh, revert reflexively to the Middle East, understandably. However, uh, as Ali Hamad mentioned to me yesterday and in fact reminded me, the Asia Pacific region is in fact where most Muslims live. The top three countries with Muslim populations more dense than anywhere in the Middle East and North Africa are Indonesia, Pakistan, and India. So it's actually very important to add to Mustafa's um, sort of uh, expose of, of the nuances that we're talking about here in Islam being a way of life, the lack of separation between church and state. You need to add your own sense of the global spread and therefore the cultural context and this linguistic complexity, which brings me really to the core of my part of this. And that is to invite you all to leave this session after you listen to me, for which thank you, with one sense, and that is the power of the word. Now, when we engage with clients as lawyers in my world, what people are looking for is for me to wield words to build something, usually to protect a family's collective investments. And by protect, I mean, try and uphold family harmony, try and prevent the breakup of a business try and anticipate that somebody at some point is going to have a sense of humor failure and attack somebody else. And in protecting those assets, whatever they be, we wanna do that exactly as Mustafa was describing from a place of respect and understanding, 
not from a place of, you know what, I know a lot of stuff and I know that you have a system of forced airship in your life. So let's work out how we fix that in this deed. It's glib and it's dangerous. It's not at all what people are looking for. Now, conversely, the creativity that is possible is a wonderful thing because many of the jurisdictions that we're interacting with haven't yet been suffocated by the kind of taxation regulation and, and other um, limits on legal creativity that we have started to experience as normal in certainly the UK and the US particularly. And so understanding Sharia, and if you haven't read the Quran, I encourage you to have a look. There are many translations, the language is beautiful. And again, the power of those words helps you, in my view, when you are drafting a document to remember that as Mustafa has said in his uh, really fantastic article, when you are setting up these structures for these families, we can't just have in mind that some common law court is going to be a jurisdiction for a family fallout. For this family, for this dad, for this mom, God is the ultimate judge. And so there is an extra responsibility when we build these things, not to be arrogant and to imagine that there's an awful lot that can be done during your lifetime that is not about tying things up and setting out a codified lot of rules, that is also about informing ourselves as professionals, but that is also about understanding truly the consequence and power of the words that we use and that bind families and businesses in ways that we really better make sure we've understood. Thank you. And I mean, overall, how, how would you rate the sensitivity of, of, of um, cultural issues? So how, how, how well do professionals dealing with clients, perhaps from the UK or Switzerland or Jersey, dealing with clients? Is it that there's a core team of recognised people that do, uh, do understand all these nuances and typically work together? Or there's a surprising number of people who aren't aware but are still involved in, in helping clients? What's your, what's your perspective there on how well professionals do in picking up and understanding these nuances? David, I think both, I, uh, most of us who do a lot of this work would recognize both those profiles. There is um, a population of remarkably able and very professionally um, versed lawyers, trustees, um, accountants, bankers, and various others who support and advise families for whom uh, Islamic finance, for whom Sharia, for whom uh, common law structures and systems become important in their family and business succession. There are uh, professionals who know how to do this properly. I don't think there are that many though. Mm. A number of them are on this call and we do know each other. Unfortunately, there are uh, you know, still very unfortunate tropes that attach to uh, what it is and what it means to advise somebody for whom Sharia is important. And uh, especially when referring to the Middle East, that tends to sometimes unfortunately spill over into what I call boardroom colonialism and which starts from a perspective of, look, I know what the answer is. I know how to do this. You just need to learn how a trust works and then everything will be good. And really, you know, to, to echo what Mustafa was saying, that just doesn't work and it tends to um, result in all kinds of problems, which end up on our desks. And I certainly am not one of those lawyers who enjoys make work projects. I'd far rather see our thinking and planning actually do what it was intended to do over time and in a way that is as unintrusive as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I think that in, in terms of 
those of us who do advise and have the privilege, frankly, of advising families who trust us with these issues. I had a, a, a conversation recently with a family for whom, you know, they were taking for granted that I understood Sharia is important to them. Their issue was more, who owns this thing that you are telling me would be good for my family and me? And when I said, well, really nobody owns it. That's why it's a, it's a good way of separating it from the fate of the individual who currently holds everything in his hands. The fate of that individual, including incapacity, including, you know, the heaven forbid, unexpected death or other life surprises that we all know happen. It really, if you start thinking about gifting, if you start thinking about lifetime arrangements that don't have to involve, as Mustafa was saying, let's just avoid this by doing something smart that, that let's not, let's not do that. Let's actually understand what do you want? What do you want? Why? And actually do I know how to do that for you? Or does somebody else? And should we be checking that there is not a simpler way of achieving? Should we just be talking about splitting share classes in a company you already know how to run? Should we not then see whether you are comfortable with that rearrangement as a family? And then perhaps if you are, maybe then you become more comfortable taking a step of hiving off, for example, an economic, the economic value attaching to shares to something that nobody actually owns, but in which you are involved in a way that doesn't undermine it. Or is that actually a step too far for you? It's that, that sort of evolving conversation requires exactly what every relationship really requires outside Central Europe, which is patience. I think we've made these conversations a bit more urgent and pressing, you know, particularly having a, a solid plan for not just domestic assets, but international. Has, has it changed the tone or is it, is it business as usual in terms of these conversations just happen over time, as you say? Patient. No, I think I, I, I honestly, I don't know whether everybody else has found, but I think COVID has done two things. One is exaggerate the anxiety of the already anxious. And two is exaggerate the apathy of the already apathetic. And so in terms of being an advisor, I don't, nobody has come to me and said, COVID scared me, quick, let's plan. But they have come to me and said, I'm a bit worried. I still haven't done anything. And that's continuing. Okay, well, thank you. We're just coming to the end of our conversation today, so I'd just like to uh, welcome back Christopher Fisher just to share some thoughts on the on the discussion that we've heard. Uh, Christopher, what, what are your what are your thoughts as we uh, come towards the end of the conversation today? Well, th thank you, thank you, David, and uh, thank you very much, Marianne, Mustafa, and Muram for this very insightful discussion. It's been a, an honour to to have you today on our on our on our panel. Um, my key takeaway here is that it, it really starts with understanding your, your client's needs. That's something that's, uh, that all, all three of you have, have, have said and I think is, is really key. Um, I, I like the fact you know, that um, Huram and Mustafa, you mentioned the Sharia products are, are, um, are for everyone. Um, it's, it's not just for the, uh, the, the Sharia Islamic investor, but it's everyone. Um, talking about capturing the opportunity, Marianne, you, you spoke about the... the, the, the uh, the global spread of of, um, of the Islamic population of the Islamic population and the opportunity that's there in meeting the needs of of, of those of those clients, uh, but most importantly, I think it was also is around the, the 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 Sharia and ESG aspect and being socially responsible. Um, we're very passionate about uh, Islamic finance at Standard Chartered Private Bank. We also have our brand promises being here for good. And I think this really ties into into what we uh, in, in, into that into into our brand promise on, on that front. So once again, thank you very much for the to the panelists. And I believe we now um, I'll hand back to David for um, a, a the networking session. Is that correct? Absolutely.